Charles Hugh Smith is without a doubt one of the most acclaimed financial authors and bloggers on the alternative media scene. In fact, his work often goes viral, hits zerohedge.com, and his interviews on shows like X22 Spotlight and others are well covered. We compiled his most recent warnings, his most critical alerts, his cream of the crop ideas into one exclusive manual at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Smith. On top of this interview, I urge you to download the PDF as it goes hand in hand with Charles's recorded interview. That's PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Smith. Enjoy this important interview. Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We want to take a quick moment just to bring you up to date about some of our most recent interviews and free reports. We just released a major interview with Gerald Salente. His exclusive report is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Salente. Also, we've released interviews with Carl Denninger, John Rubino, and silver guru David Morgan, who gave us his latest on silver, which is trading at 83 to 1 ratio to gold. That report is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Morgan. And our epic interview and report with Robert David Steele, where he disclosed bombshell information. That report can be found at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Robert. And of course, Bob Moriarty with his exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Bob. And we round it up with our most recent interview releases with the legendary G. Edward Griffin, who exposed some new huge developments at the Federal Reserve. His free PDF report is available at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash G. And with that news update, we are honored to be welcoming back to the show one of the living legends of the alternative media financial industry, Mr. Charles Hugh Smith. Charles is the author behind of twominds.com blog. He has written 11 books. He has published on mega financial websites, including Zero Hedge, Peak Prosperity, and the Kaiser Report. Charles helped us to create his own exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Smith, where he went into new depths about some highly important topics which he has never publicly shared. Charles, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm honored to join such a uh, tremendous cast of, of guests that you've had on recently. Oh. We are honored to have everyone on our show. We have just a stellar group of guests, including yourself. Charles, we want to start off by looking back in time. We're seeing something very interesting happening during the days of the Civil War compared to now. That was about 150 years ago. We saw a financial bubble at that time in railroad stocks and subprime train tracks lending. That might sound a little bit familiar to our audience, that financial bubble burst and Wall Street made up of the banks at that time begged President Ulysses S. Grant to bail them out. In their words, quote unquote, the country will fall apart if he doesn't. But President Grant chose not to help them. So it seems very interesting and sort of a repetitive scenario, Charles. In 2008, modern day bankers, once again, spread that very same fear, citing the fact that they had somehow once again misplaced all of the money that we had entrusted in their banks and that citizens would quote unquote, along with the country, go down in flames if they did not receive bailout money from the federal government through QE programs and otherwise. Charles, what would have happened in 2008 if we would have just let the free market deal with the bank's own subprime problem? Well, that's a great question, Michelle, and I'm, I'm happy you um, went into the subject with the historical background, which, of course, is a pattern, as you suggest, that was repeated again in the 1890s and then in the crash of uh, 1929, which was all the same uh, dynamic you described, which was over lending, uh, lending to marginal or unqualified uh, borrowers for highly speculative uh, ventures. And so, of course, the highly speculative ventures usually blow up and the marginal borrowers default and then the banks are in trouble. Well, what would have happened? It's an interesting question. And many of us were uh, hoping at the time um, that we'd find out. 
Um, I think what would have happened is the federal government would have used its power uh, to take over the insolvent banks. There would have been a um, transfer of responsibility, but uh, the banking industry would have gone on as usual. Every employee would have still been doing their job. It's just that the management would no longer be um, responsible to the board of directors and the federal government would have liquidated the default um, defaulted assets and sold them on the open market for pennies on the dollar. And if we want to find a recent um, example of how this works, we can look at the SNL crisis of the late um, 1980s, when exactly this same scenario played out on a slightly smaller scale, but it was still huge. You know, tens of billions of dollars of um, defaulted loans had to be, um, and, and collateral had to be auctioned off by the government agencies, and they, and they did so. And um, it did cost the taxpayer uh, a lot of money, but the economy was uh, large enough that we could handle it. And I think that's the scenario that would have played out in 2008. But it seems our educational system sort of wipes that clean. They don't teach about this kind of stuff so that when people see the repetition or this, uh-oh, here it comes again kind of scenario, um, what would you say to that? What could change so that we're aware of what's happening? Well, that is another great topic, Michelle, and I, this is why I'm so happy that um, you and your colleagues are, are creating this content for regular people and um, giving them access to these people uh, like uh, Salente and, and um, your other guests who, who've written extensively about this and you're kind of able to summarize these, these key insights into why our economy is so troubled and why it's so precarious all the time. I think that uh, we are lacking, frankly, in, at the high school level um, and the college level in terms of personal finance. In other words, how um, just how m households can best manage their assets and grow their assets. And, and that's really poorly explained, I think. Uh, I know some schools attempt to do so, and there are some classes in economics and so on. But I think we've really... Uh, uh, given short shrift to our students in terms of explaining the complexities of personal finance, which nowadays depends a lot on, on borrowing money, student loans or credit cards, um, mortgages. And um, so if we were able to start with personal finance, then that might be an avenue into these larger uh, topics that we're discussing about the dynamics of, of finance and the entire economy. I think what once people are educated and they realize that this is just a repetitive scenario from people that know history being the bankers, they get in, they know, they know what's worked in the past. They know that they were bailed out if they lose all of this money or it's misplaced or somehow just gone. Um, and then they become very wealthy. Then the federal government will be, you know, be so afraid of letting them topple. Uh, unlike. President Grant, who just said, no, that's just an extraordinary thing in these times. You know what I mean? I don't think that people realize that that occurred. Yeah, that's, that's so true, Michelle. And I think one dynamic we can um, highlight that's a little different is, um, you know, Wall Street's always been a dominant force and there's always been a relatively small number of uh, banks and investment banks. And, um, but in terms of commercial banking, in other words, not investment banking like Morgan Stanley or uh, Goldman Sachs, um, but just commercial banks like Wells Fargo and the Bank of America and so on that issued, um, you know, checking and credit uh, card accounts and, and, and issued home mortgages and, and that, um, that kind of banking. That industry has consolidated enormously since um, previous decades. And so there's a, you can look at a chart, I think it's pretty common on the internet, where there was once dozens of major regional banks and those all were bought up and consolidated into six mega banks uh, before the 2008 crisis. So that's part of what I think the problem is, is that capitalism can only thrive if there's a diversity and competition. And so when you shrink the number of players down to a handful, then it becomes like a cartel. And of course, a cartel then controls prices and there's no real competition. And then when they, when they get in trouble, they, they dominate the industry. So the entire industry is in trouble. So in other words, if we had a hundred, uh, like we used to, a hundred major regional banks, if, a, if five or six got into trouble, oh, clearly that wouldn't bring the whole system down. But when you only have five or six mega banks, when a few of them get in trouble, then the whole system becomes extremely fragile. 
And so that's where the federal government has, uh, you know, the representatives that are supposed to represent the interests of the people failed. You know, the regulators failed by allowing this intense concentration of wealth. And then once you get that wealth concentration, then you get the huge tens of millions of dollars in com- campaign contributions, and then they buy Congress. So uh, it's, it's, that's a dynamic that I think has, has, has worsened since uh, the previous uh, financial panics that we we're, were discussing. You know, you bring up a great point in that capitalism can only thrive with competition. So when you consolidate huge industries such as banking, you're really attacking the way of life of capitalism and you're taking it toward what everyone is talking right now about. And there's a rather large fight that's going to start, I think, in terms of socialism, even communism entering the ideals of the people that are making the laws right now. So that's a really scary and important point for everybody to think about, that the consolidation of those banks is an attack on capitalism. Precisely. Very well said. Yes. Now, Charles, turning now to the battles of central planning, we know that the top 10% of U.S. households now own 90% of equities. So they obviously want lower interest rates as long as they can see them happen. The average person would like nothing more than higher interest rates, even if he doesn't know it, since it makes the government more frugal and gives savings higher yields, and mostly it will deflate the prices of everything for everyday items. Thirdly, the global economy is slowing down. So the Fed is desperately fighting higher precious metals prices. Has the Fed lost all credibility with the decision to pause? What are your thoughts? Well, that's, that's also uh, a, a highly um, stimulating and um, controversial question because um, as you know, and most of our listeners know, the, the general take is the Fed caved in and um, surrendered its, its uh, responsibilities to the larger economy uh, to uh, prop the stock market back up. And there's certainly some element of this. It's, it's so obvious, it's re- really undeniable. And we can maybe go back to 2009 when the S&P 500 was uh, at famously 666, um, almost exactly 10 years ago. And now it's pushing 2,800. So you've seen a tremendous increase. I mean, a, a quadrupling of stocks while the real economy as measured by GDP has gone up around 43%. So you've seen this incredible um, asset bubble in stocks as a result of that super low interest rate that you've described. And so if we think back now, uh, you know, over kind of historically to the good days of say the 1960s or so on, uh, mortgages were, were higher than they were now. You, you, maybe 5% or 6% was considered normal. And when inflation kicked up in the 80s and so on, then it was as high as 10 or 12% was, was normal. And so we're, we're at really abnormally low levels of interest rates and yields. Um, in other words, this is unprecedented. And so we have to think, well, why, why has the Fed been um, obligated or why, why have they chosen to, to keep interest rates at at levels that are below um, the best times the economy's had in the last 70 years. And it must indicate that they're fearful, right? That the economy is more precarious and more fragile than they're letting on. And so they have to keep interest rates really low. But as you point out, there's a cost to that. Um, Pension funds can't earn enough money now. Um, And at uh, low interest rates, as you say, have created bubbles in stocks and houses. So uh, a house that, that might, you know, historically be worth 200000 is now 400000 and therefore unaffordable. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of unintended consequences to that super low interest rate policy. Charles, are we at a point where issuing debt cannot stimulate the economy? Is free money not even worth the free price anymore because debt is becoming so dangerous for balance sheets? Well, I think I think your question um, is really timely uh, because we were piling up debt at a tremendous rate, both uh, at the federal government level, private debt, and uh, and corporate debt. Right, everyone's borrowing like crazy, essentially, 
And this is global, of course. You know, China has created uh, huge uh, uh, amounts of debt that, you know, they, they went, their economy went from $7 trillion in total debt, public and private, uh, in 2008 to like $40 trillion now. <laughs> so we're not the only ones uh, borrowing like, like mad. And um, you, you bring up two points. One is um, debt, uh, sort of what I call debt exhaustion, that, you know, it, when there's very little debt in the system, if you borrow a dollar and spend it, um, you're going to get a, a big boost in GDP. Um, but when, you, when you've when um, you already borrowed heavily, then borrowing and spending another dollar doesn't really do much. And that's, that's, where, we're, um, that's where we're at now. So there's that element that, that borrowing and spending no longer generates the returns it did early on. And the other issue is the tremendous size of debt. And again, I, I like the fact that we're talking, we're bringing history in. And if we go back to the period when interest rates went up a lot, the late uh, 70s and early 80s, when Fed Chair Volcker had to raise interest rates to control inflation, the economy suffered, you know, that auto sales and housing dropped as interest rates soared. but um, it it, um, it was doable. In other words, the economy had a sharp recession for 18 months or two years, and then, and then it recovered and, and grew strongly for decades. Now you have to ask, could, could we survive if interest rates went, went back up to historical levels, like a mortgage might be 6 7 8%, and a bond yield might be 5 or 6%? Could we survive? And then the answer is probably not. <laughs> because there's so much debt out there that that, that doubling of, of, of interest would uh, drive a tremendous number of, of households, corporations, and local governments uh, you know, into insolvency, you know, default. It's so interesting that prices are so inflated right now that a person, you know, if interest rates went up to 10, 12, 15% so that you could really make a lot in your savings because of interest rates, then homes would be just completely out of the question, any borrowing, because it would be so huge simply because of the prices now, correct? Right. And so there's a, uh, we can imagine it's like a seesaw that if mortgage rates uh, doubled from, or even went up 50% from four and a half to say 7%, the price of the house would have to drop um, by a, a comparative amount in order to be affordable to the vast majority of people. So a house that's 500,000, if interest rates go up 50%, it's going to drop by at least a third just to become um, affordable. So that you're right that the housing bubble and um, the corporate bond bubble and a lot of bubbles would pop with higher interest rates. But as you said earlier in the program, wouldn't this actually benefit the vast majority of people? And the answer is yes, by dropping, uh, by reducing the cost of these assets and reducing the price of, of everything in the economy, so-called deflation. Exactly. And then also because we take such a hit on our savings account, you can't earn anything if you have savings in the bank. In fact, they're talking about negative interest rates, which is happening throughout much of the world. That's right. Um, I just saw some number. I mean, there's something like, um, you know, several hundred billion dollars in negative interest rate bonds in Europe and, and, and Asia. So, um, again, I think we're, the larger topic here is how can our leadership, our elected leadership and the, the private sector leadership, how can they improve the situation to, so that the system works for 90% of us instead of 10% of us? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, Charles, how do you envision what the next recession and global depression might look like? Many people have been drawing so many pictures in their minds. From your perspective, how bad could it become? Well, I'm, I'm so happy you asked that question because I've spent a lot of time thinking and writing about that recently. And my sense is that... Um, the vast expansion of, of debt that we've discussed and, and, the, and the diminishing returns on that debt mean that the coming recession, whether it starts this year or 2020, will be deeper and more pro, uh, prolonged than the last several recessions. And, and the reason why I think this is that um, we've, number one, m many people alive today have never had a, a real recession. They've never lived through a, a recession like the one in 81, 82, which was very severe, you know, sharp spikes in unemployment and um, um, a lot of suffering throughout the economy. 
The recession of 1990 to 91 was rather brief and shallow. The recession in 2008-9 was also rather brief and shallow. It, it hit people who were exposed to the subprime uh, mortgage situation and so on. But in general, it was rather quick um, because the Federal Reserve was able to take this, uh, these very aggressive actions, you know, lowering interest rates to zero, flooding the economy with liquidity and so on. My idea is um, they're going to do that again because that's what's worked in the past, but it's not going to work this time because the economy has changed. There's too much debt and, and just trying to get people to borrow and spend is not going to work anymore. So what do you think is going to happen? Because there, that is pretty much the consensus that they're just not going to be able to do it again. Right. And, and the reason why it's a consensus, at least in the alternative uh, financial media, is that you know, the, if the conditions change, the strategy has to change. And so the conditions have changed. So just repeating the same strategy is not going to work. And so what I envision, and a lot of other people uh, think the same thing for similar reasons, They'll lower interest rates to zero, maybe try to force everybody to, to, to borrow and spend by, by even pushing interest rates negative, like we were talking about, where you'll get a minus 0.1% on your bond instead of a positive yield. You'll actually lose money buying a bond. And the idea here is to force us to spend our cash to boost the economy, right? But um, if, if everybody that's qualified to borrow more no longer wants to borrow more, then the only uh, borrowers out there for lenders to go to are the unqualified people who will default very quickly. And that will lead to a, another banking crisis. Because the, if the only people who want to borrow are unqualified and, and speculative borrowers, that's just setting up another crisis of default. And politically, I think the winds have changed. The public is no longer willing to rubber stamp um, the, the, the bailout of, of speculative lending and, and banks. And so I don't think the, the, they're gonna be able to repeat the 2008. So what hap I think what will happen is the lower interest rates are zero again, nothing will happen, the economy will deepen, and it, the recession will deepen, and then they're gonna go crazy by um, issuing free money, whether it's called um, you know, the New Green Deal or um, universal basic income, you know, give every household a thousand bucks a month, they're going to do something really drastic like that, and that's going to create inflation. And unfortunately, in as, I, as we discussed earlier, it, we can't support a higher interest rate that's going to come with inflation anymore. Because if you get over indebted, you can't afford that higher interest payment. And so, they've they the Federal Reserve and the other uh, you know the government agencies they're going to basically trap us in an economy where. They can't raise interest rates, but they're, they've created inflation. And so that's going to hurt everybody because, of course, we all know what happens with inflation. You know, the, the $5 sandwich now costs $15. <laughs> right. And that means we all get less for our money. Right. You know, Venezuela is something, you know, we always talk about here. It's a huge subject throughout the entire world. President Trump is talking about it. They're trying to handle it, but we're going down that road. We're going down that road and people are like, well, I have $40,000, you know, outside of the bank. It won't affect me. And it's like, not when you wake up and that buys you four loaves of bread. You know what I mean? It, and it just happens so fast with Venezuela. So people really need, and if those four loaves of bread are in the grocery stores, that's what they're facing. That's right. And, you know, Michelle, I'm sure that many of your, uh, you know, uh, viewers and, and, and uh, guests have, have said, you know, people don't believe this can happen in the U.S., right? We're the biggest economy. We have the strongest currency and so on. But I can tell you, because I was alive at the time, inflation, once it starts kicking up, which it did in the late 70s and the early 80s, it is devastating. You know, 10 percent a year well, in five years of that, that's, oh, that's 50 plus percent decline in your purchasing power. So um, it, it adds up very quickly. And what I'm, I'm trying to describe is how we've boxed ourselves in to where the solution that was um, to high inflation in the past was to raise interest rates a lot. And that, that's the only way to suppress inflation once it kicks in. So that solution is no longer available, available to us. And so that's what's terrifying about the Venezuelan model that you describe, you know, that the government um, in Venezuela 
stripping away all the ideological, uh, you know, I, uh, things that people talk about now, what they really did was they just kept printing money to spend it to fulfill the promises that they'd made. And so um, that's another, it's a political trap, right? You've made promises, you got to keep the promises, so you print the money, and then you end up um, destroying your currency. There it is. There it is. That's, that's, that is the bottom line nutshell of it. And if we continue to, con- to allow our government to print money, that's why this Green Deal is such a catastrophe, you know, and, and to support that and to not realize that all they're doing is printing money to make that happen. And we're headed toward a cliff and we're driving in the dark and we don't know when that cliff is going to hit. You know what I mean? You just, you don't know where it's at, but when it hits, it hits so fast. And that's what's terrifying to people that know this. That's right. And, and, and the fact that patience is required. In other words, um, people who, who um, understand this and decided to buy hedges, you know, which, in other words, things that will um, be sort of inflation proof, like precious metals, um, then, of course, they've gone nowhere for five years. And everyone who invested in these bubbles has made a ton of money. And so, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's hard. The timing is, is very difficult. And so you have to, if you're going to hedge your, your wealth, you have to kind of buy the hedges and forget about it. You know, because you can't, it's very difficult to time when the bubbles will finally um, pop. Speaking of hedges, talk to us about what we should be doing. Well, you've had a lot of terrific uh, guests on who know um, the precious metals markets, and um, they understand that the the catastrophe that the Fed policy is going to lead to better than I do. But I think that the basic idea here is if the government can inflate its currency in order to solve some political or financial problems, it will do so, right? It has the power to do so. So what you want is an asset that the government can't inflate away. And so this is, of course, traditionally gold and silver and uh, maybe platinum and some of the other metals. And um, more recently, a lot of people are believers in cryptocurrency. And I've written a lot about this. And, um, you know, I'm not um, I understand people's reluctance to, to buy into the cryptocurrency story. But I think that the the um, the reason why a lot of people are interested in cryptocurrencies is for the same reason. It's an asset that the government doesn't control and can't inflate away. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. And of course, obviously, things um, that are in the material world, like, you know, farmland and tools and, and, and that kind of thing, they tend to survive inflation, right? <laughs> They're still here after the bubble pops and there's a new currency. And, and, you know, this is what's, speaking of that kind of scenario, what usually happens in, in hyperinflation or very high inflation is the government then announces a, a new currency, right? And so a thousand of the old dollars is now one dollar. <laughs> and, right. and, and so that's the kind of thing. And so if you, and in my analogy is, you know, if you have a, a saw or some kind of tool, it might be worth a hundred thousand dollars at the top of hyperinflation. And then after the the, the, the currency's, you know, relaunched, it's worth a dollar, it still provided the same value to you, th- whether it was worth a dollar or a hundred thousand right, dollars. So the that's the kind of thinking I think we can uh, uh, pursue. Yeah. And what people don't realize, because they've never lived through it, is literally, you know, $40,000 can buy you four loaves of bread. They, you know, it's literally, you think that you're safe because you've got this tucked away, but not if your government prints money to the point where one day you wake up and it's worthless. One day you're fine. Wednesday you're fine. Thursday it's all over. And what do you do? So um, switching to politics for a moment, Charles, do you think that President Trump is a shoe-in for 2020? <laughs> wow, now that's, that's a provocative question. Here you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my personal opinion is, um, and, and this is not related to his ideology or even his character, but um, just to kind of past uh, history of presidents is, uh, you know, President Trump is, is not a young man. He's not a, a President Kennedy or a President Obama. He's not in his 40s or early 50s. And I, I suspect he may just tire of, of the tremendous burdens of being a president, right, which we all know by looking at photos of of presidents when they enter office and when they leave office, they're pretty beaten up. Whether they're Democrats or Republicans or independents, it's a tremendous amount of, of responsibility and burden. So 
it wouldn't surprise me if President Trump decides to leave on a high note and just um, and 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 uh, decides not to run because of of health issues or just um, he's tired of it, uh, you know. And so that's a possibility <laughs> that I don't see too many people talking about. Well, you know what? I just did an amazing interview with Robert David Steele, and he said ah. exactly that. He shocked me. That was the first person that I've heard actually say that President Trump might not run in 2020. And I was like, what? So you really think that's a possibility also? Yeah, because I think, I think if we say anything about President Trump's character is, you know, he's, um, he's an independent guy. In other words, he's not going to do what somebody tells him to do. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if he decides I've had enough, then we can be pretty confident that he's out, you know, and, um, and he may feel that he's done all he can. And there's something to be said for that, right? That, that, you know, you've done, you've done, you've done all you can and you don't want four more years of all the uh, drama, trauma and stress. All the attacks. I know a whole lot of people that would be really upset with that notion. So let's <laughs> hope he runs. <laughs> Staying on the topic of politics. Are you worried about the wealth gap and the rise of populism? I'm not worried about the rise of populism because it's, it's a rational response to the rise of inequality. And, you know, I think we can simplify this um, in that the economy's no longer working for the bottom 90%, right? And so what's our response when it's no longer working for us? Well, we're going to protest in some way. And so we're going to vote for the alternative candidates. Um, we're going to make it known that we're not happy with the fact that our standard of living is declining, not going up. And, um, you know, I would summarize this like the GDP went up 43 percent in 10 years. Are you 43 percent better off? And the vast majority of Americans are going to say no. Their, their money buys less and they didn't participate in these huge asset bubbles. And, um, or even if they did and their house is worth twice as much, it's not really changing their life for the better because their medical bills are higher, their college tuition is higher, and their living expenses are higher. So populism is, a, is, is I think it's a, a, a term that the media is using to um, denigrate um, the protest of the average person. And it, uh, it, it, populism is just another, I think, a term for, I want, to make my voice heard and that I want some kind of true representation of my interests and that, that we call that populism. And in, in that sense, it's a good thing. Exactly. Something that's been ignored for a while. Now, Charles, how does China fit into this overall picture? In your view, will China rule this century? And if so, what do you make of their incredible challenge with the one child per family policy? It's caused a situation, hasn't it? They have a huge number of retirees, over 330 million, without enough working people now to support this. What are your thoughts? Well, you've, you've just summarized it in a, in a nutshell that um, China will not rule the 21st century and the reasons why um, we can go through them very briefly. One is, as you say, demographics, that once your working population starts shrinking, which is um, already happening in Japan and Italy and, and um, you know, low birth rate countries, and China's, China's online to be next because of the one child policy. And that more recently, it's become very expensive um, in China. That It's not a cheap country to live in anymore. And I hear this from our Chinese friends. Now, I've visited China and I have friends who live there. I have friends who went to college there. They're Chinese nationals and they, they live in Europe or elsewhere. So I think I have some pretty good on the ground intelligence that the cost of living is really high now. So a lot of younger Chinese households are not having a lot of kids because it's too expensive. <laughs> Just like here, you have one child because that's all you can afford and you have to be pretty well off to have two. And so, that, so we can't, what, what I'm saying is we're not going to see some gigantic birth um, bubble in China that's going to solve their demographic problem. You know, it's, it, that's the thing about demographics is it's already wired in, right? <laughs> you can't change the number of people who are going to enter the workforce in five years. And so China's got the demographic problem. They've got another problem, which is a great many of their people in the West are still very poor. 
they make, you know, $50 a month or $100 a month. And, um, you know, uh, this, in other words, it's not an, uh, a uniformly wealthy country. The, the, the coastline and, and their upper middle class is, is wealthy, but hundreds of millions of other people are, are not yet at that level. So they have a lot of, of, of public cost if, if you're going to try to raise the living standards of those um, five to 800 million people who are still impoverished. The other thing is they've had this huge upsurge in, in debt, which I described from 7 trillion 10 years ago to 40 trillion now. So now they're facing the inevitable results of that. Um, a tremendous expansion of debt and malinvestment. Defaults, corporate defaults, um, slowing growth, uh, decline in lending, all those things that come um, as a result of that. So even though they're a central planning economy, they've succeeded. Um, and their, their rapid growth was, was dependent on freeing certain parts of their economy to the public, to capitalism, essentially, right? And so they, they now have the worst of all possible worlds. They have all the inefficiencies and malinvestment of central planning, and they have all the consequences of a speculative bubble in the private sector. And there are no solutions to, to both of those issues. Man, it's just amazing when you look at the whole world. It's like, look what's going on there. Well, look what's going on there. Well, <laughs> the United States actually looks pretty good in comparison to that, as long as we can rein in our problems. We got to recognize it before it becomes insurmountable. I think that's the challenge. That's right. No, that's right. We, we have a much more stable um, and, and more diverse economy and society than, than most other countries. So we, we have a good foundation if, if we don't destroy it with over indebtedness. <laughs> if we don't allow our political leaders to destroy it. We've got That's to right. take control of this. Charles, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everybody about your books and about your blog and what's coming up for you in the near future. Well, thank you for that. Um, my latest book is called Pathfinding Our Destiny, and it's about saving our democratic republic. Um, and it, uh, it deals more with finance and the economy than with politics per se. Like, I don't think politics is really the solution. The solution is, as we've discussed on this program, and I go into that a little bit more in, in that book. And then you can visit me at of2minds.com and read um, sample chapters of my books and tons of other free stuff. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming back on the show today. Thank you for the excellent questions. and. Um, and uh, topics, Michelle. Excellent. Mr. Charles Hugh Smith, expert in the alternative media financial industry and who goes in depth in our exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Smith. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Halliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. In March, we've already released a no-holds-barred interview with Bob Moriarty. He really went hard on Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. You can go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Bob for the details. We also plan on releasing one of the bombshell interviews of the year, conducted with David Stockman. In the month of February, we have released a worldwide scoop with G. Edward Griffin, the 87-year-old best-selling author who introduced the world to the banking cartel and has published with us the PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash G Critical Federal Reserve Update. We also just released interviews with the man who exposes the deep state and the shenanigans of Washington better than anybody else, Robert David Steele, and I highly suggest going to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Robert. Of course, for the most accurate information on Charles Hugh Smith's latest and best, go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Smith. It's essential reading.